Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the SOARS event director. And one of the silver linings of this pandemic and of virtual events has been the ability to reach audiences and community beyond our neighborhood here in Brooklyn. Today, we're collaborating with our friends at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington, and the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith in Massachusetts to bring you a transcontinental, transatlantic event. Translator Philip Rotten, uh, critic and author Will Chancellor, and our very own bookseller emeritus, Ezra Goldstein, join us to discuss Halder Laksnes and his novel Salka Valka, which was just published in Phil's translation by Archipelago Books right here in Brooklyn. So thank you all for spending the evening or afternoon with us wherever you are. Now to some housekeeping before I properly introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. Actually, I'm going to enable it right now. Um, but yeah, you can click on the live transcription button, button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There is also a chat box, which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. We're entering a bit of a slow season through events, but we have some really exciting ones planned for you this summer. So do head to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is this Saturday, July 23rd, we're back with Third Place and Archipelago to welcome Ida Yesen, who will be discussing her new book, A Postcard for Annie in conversation with Anne Michaels. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Philip Rotten has translated the work of Halder Laksnes, Jon Kalman Stefansson, Kristen Maria Balder's daughter, and many others. He has been awarded the American Scandinavian Foundation Translation Prize for his rendering of Laksnes's work twice, uh, in 2001 for Iceland's Bell, and again in 2015 for Wayward Heroes. He also received the 2016 Oxford Weidenfeld Prize for his translation of Jon Kalman Stefansson's The Heart of Man. He lives in Iceland and is joining us from there. Will Chancellor is the author of the novel A Brave Man Seven Stories Tall. He studied political theory and environmental policy at Stanford and later finished his postgrad work in physics and ancient Greek. Chancellor has written for Book Forum, BuzzFeed, Electric Literature, Interview Magazine, The Rumpus, and The Schofield, among others. He currently works as an editor of the fiction column for Brooklyn Rail and is writing his second novel. And if you're joining us here tonight, there's a good chance that Ezra Goldstein no, needs no introduction. He was, until retiring recently, a co-owner of Community Bookstore and Terrace Books in Brooklyn, and before which he was also a journalist. So without any further ado, I will hand it off to you three. Will, Ezra, Phil, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Noah. Uh, this is a real pleasure, um, uh, especially to uh, any Laxus uh, fans out there. Uh, Phil's translation of Salka Valka is uh, a wonder. Uh, I, if you haven't read it, please do as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm going to kick this to Will, who's going to give you a very brief uh, introduction to the novel, and uh, we'll go from there. Will? Thank you. Um, Salka Valka was kind of the mystery masterpiece, if that's, if that's possible. Uh, I got really into laxness in my 20s and was in Iceland and everyone had talked about this, you know, I, I would try to impress them with naming this whole stack of laxness novels over here and they would say, oh, but you're missing the real one. The real one is Salka Valka. And there, there wasn't really a translation that was immediately available until Archipelago just released this. So I was really excited to get this story, uh, just a little bit of synopsis. It is about a woman named Sigurlina and her daughter, Salka Valka, who come from the north to a small fishing village. And like so many of Laxness's novels, it focuses on the harsh reality of making it in this world that a lot of times gets um, glossed over. And I think the, the story is at once uh, a story of the disillusionment of the mother and the growth of the daughter uh, functions something like a Bildungsroman of, of a woman who has the audacity to wear pants uh, and grow up in this, in this harsh community of fisher people that are largely being exploited by a capitalist uh, 
businessman. So um, the story, it, it's so easy to slide into spoilers, but I think it's best maybe just to, to leave it there. Um, so one of the things that's so exciting about this new translation is that uh, the, the last, the only other English translation was done in 1936 and Laxness was not at all fond of it. He felt that it, uh, it lacked, um, well, in large part, one of the key elements of his writing, which is humor. And, and it's so strange to talk about humor when you think about Laxness in a, in a superficial sense, because his novels are so, seem so bleak and uh, depressing, <laughs> but they're also very funny. And, and, and at times you feel almost guilty uh, when you, when it strikes you, when it occurs to you that, that there's humor in here. Um, so Phil, maybe you could talk about that a bit, because that seems like the, the hallmark, the most significant hallmark of Laxus's writing, that this strange, uh, unexpected overlay of, of humor uh, in, in, over a, a bleak and, and social, what you, a novel that you might otherwise refer to as social realism. Yeah, like you said, the, um, I think it was uh, Laxness was quoted in in the New uh, New Yorker review of Sokovalka when he said that uh, the earlier translation missed about 50% of his style. And uh, the quotation, I think, if I, as far as I recall, he goes on to say, and all of my humor <laughs> or something like that, or most of my humor. So, and... Um, I think there was another review in, in Sidecar recently that, uh, by Ben Libman, and he said, Laxness's prose sings right through with la laughter. And said that, that Laxness himself said during his socialist years, I must be getting old because it isn't as much fun shocking the bourgeoisie anymore. There's like this playfulness in Laxness. And um, I know that playfulness figures heavily in, in Will's novel, um, The Brave, Brave Man, Seven Stories Tall. So, um, I, and for myself, I, I find it all over the place in, in Sokovalka, which sometimes you hear is such a political novel, but, but while I was translating it, I found myself laughing out loud all the time. And like Ezra said, sometimes you feel guilty about it because Laxness himself said, this is a book about the poor and you, the suffering of the poor and how they're exploited. And their, their suffering is something that is really touching, poignant, pathetic, tragic, and unforgettable. But I mean, it's really hard not to laugh when you hear about someone who's given seed potatoes so he can sustain himself, <laughs> you know, with, with potatoes and he says in the end I just had to eat the seed potatoes you know or or when the when when Laxness writes that the the children of the village curse less when they have milk to drink so it's actually and I'm I was mentioning this earlier with Ezra that that milk is such an important image symbol in the, in the novel I didn't really realize it until today and I was looking through it all the milk images, but there's actually one poem in the middle of the, of the novel that's about um, like milk, if milk could replace the sea and, and butter replace the, <laughs> butter fill the meadows and stuff like this. And it's like this kind of a big rock candy mountain image that, you know, the poor people just want the butter and the milk and the tallow and everything like this. So, but, um, yeah, I could um, take us into uh, one particular passage that shows a little bit of this sort of wry or I don't know how you would really describe it. It's sort of this combination of sadness and, and humor. It, should I read this little passage? Or, okay. Please, please. So in the middle, somewhere in there, in the middle, I won't, sorry about the context here, but he, he, um, he juxt, Laxness juxtaposes some verses from the Salvation Army with um, people's actual responses to the weather. And so he starts with, it's waves to you, new blessings bring that cause your heart with joy to sing. This is one of 
Sigurlina, the mother, is one of her favorite verses she's singing in the Salvation Army meetings. And then Lakshmi says, but on Good Friday, that famous day, which is in fact dedicated to the suffering and death of the Redeemer, sleep blew in again from the sea. It's looking a bit, bit bleak now, said folk disappointedly, because even though those living on these shores for the last thousand years had forever been subject to unpredictable storms, they found them just as peculiar every time and always held on to hope of something better. So this verse is about hope, <laughs> but it's the kind of hope that you get from escaping from reality. And this is an important point in Sokovalka, actually, the escapism of religion and the escapism of a sort of political ideals and stuff. They sort of Sigurlina escapes from reality through religion and Artnoller escapes from reality through trade unions and trade act and union activity. Um, but anyway, it goes on and it says that, um, so they've been forever subject to, uh, they found the storms as peculiar every, every time, but always held on to hope of something better. Just look at the salty snowflakes that plump down on this less than epic and unfantastical village. But later in the day, the snowstorm transformed into water whipped along by the strong salty sea wind. And so the storm continued through the night. It seeped into people's abodes through, through its beloved cracks. The storm loves the cracks of the house. The, the, it seeped into people's abodes through its beloved cracks and, was the, and wet the children of the workers' huts in their beds, making them catch cold. Such an immensity of water there is in the air. And then we have a next verse, and hope ever pouring from that spring, streaming forth, streaming forth. So as the water continues to stream forth, <laughs> the verse reflects it in an opposite way. So, But it's very interesting, this little sentence in the middle of the passage, just look at the salty snowflakes that plump down. And I actually laughed when I read this in Icelandic because it's just so odd and it's like, it, it's in Icelandic, it's sjau hinar saltu snowflakes or sem hlussuðist yfir þetta miður sögulega og æfitirast nauða plás. And the word for, what did I say, the plump down on, yeah, hlussa can be like a splot, so actually you could translate this splotch down on the village. It's this like kind of absurd image in the middle of this juxtaposition of religious verses with people's reactions to the weather. And when he says this, which means like less than his remarkable, which means um, adventure deprived village. And, and I, had to, I had to really play with this a lot because adventure deprived doesn't really sound that great in, <laughs> when you're reading along in prose. So I finally chose unfantastical, but the word in Icelandic, Iventiri, is one of those Icelandic words that is really hard to translate it because it means adventure or fairy tale or uh, things, things of that nature, just all in one word. So, but I, I always find it difficult just to translate it adventure or something. So I chose unfantastical. And if you've ever seen the movie Summer with Monica, there's a good example of an unfantastical presentation of the city of Stockholm. It's completely bleak. <laughs> so, but yeah, so there's there's an interesting hu humor in there. This this actually made me laugh when I was translating it. So. Bill, you reminded me of something, um, and I should have said this by way of introduction, the chief antagonist is uh, Steintor, this just beast of a man who kind of reminds me of, of Heathcliff um, from Wuthering Heights, this, you know, this force who's almost like a storm and his, in, it, he actually ties into both of the things that you were saying. So his, um, his initial, you know, his comment about, he's talking to the, to the Dean, who's like the local uh, religious magistrate about the, about his soul. And that he says, like, don't you want your soul to go to heaven? And he says, no, like when I'm dead, the only consolation I want is just to be dead. I don't want to deal with anything after that. And that, you know, that um, that combines a lot of the elements of the humor, but also the the independence that you see in in 
um, in that Icelandic spirit. But there was one, the, the passage that it really reminded me of was the same way that the, uh, that the wind comes in here. And this is on page 252, right around where you read. You know whom you're dealing with, Deansy. I was born here in Asari, on this seashore, in precisely the same way that the onshore winds churn up the surf. Would you ask the wind to take responsibility for you? What am I? A wind that comes, a wind that goes. The wind in my nostrils is the wind that blows at this seashore. The same goes for the blood in my veins, a wave that rises, a wave that falls. Human life is nothing but this, neither here in this village nor anywhere else that I know of abroad. You know, this, um, this combination of, to me, I can't ever quite pull apart the Icelandic spirit from the Icelandic land, you know, yeah. the, the weather. I wonder, um, both Ezra and Phil, how you guys saw the, the inner relationship of, of environment and character in, you know, in, in Salka Valka as well as in, in Steinthor. Should I answer? Do you want to answer first, Ezra? No, no, but I, I want to expand on the question, actually, because, okay. I, you know, of all the characters, you know, Laxness uh, it has, has said many times, and it's been said about him many times, that he he comes out of the saga tradition, that, uh, that the sagas are so much of what they made him who he was, made him the writer who he was. Uh, of all the characters in the book, I thought that Steinthor was seemed to me to be the most uh, reflective of the sagas and maybe also Salka herself. Um, you know, with Steinthor saying, I am Iceland, you know, and, and uh, I'm the weather, I'm the rocks, I'm the sea. Uh, is that, do you think that's uh, accurate? Um, I think it's, a, it's an interesting perspective, actually. So, um, because when I think about the old sagas, I think about um, I think about the the people, and less so the weather, because they very because the weather is a very almost minuscule part of the the old sagas. Like sometimes you think, why didn't the saga writers write how beautiful? The landscape looks, you know, or like down in in Nyalso country, they have a view of the Westman Islands. Like, how? Why not say how nice the Westman Islands look with the sort of mist of the sea coming, or something like that, or rainbows in the sky? Iceland could be called Rainbow Land. There's so many rainbows in. It. Um, usually, the sagas are sort of like everybody meets in the summer at the Althingi, argues, fights. And then nothing happens over the winter. So, but it's but I, I can see the point in this the character of Steinthor and how he expresses himself in this sort of arrogant and also I am the land. Yeah, I think because when you look at the one thing that's interesting about Iceland in comparison with like say the rest of Europe is with the rest of Europe you have you have um, visual. Um, evidence of say medieval life in the castles and things like this but in Iceland all you have is the landscape there are no castles or anything like that here and so when you when you travel around the countryside you, you can see the same landscape that the saga characters saw uh, without any sort of like things blocking it or things that take you back to actual history you sort of live in the stories of the sagas, which I find very interesting. And so Thor is this kind of character. I think you're very right in, in your assessment of him in that sense. Um, I also think that, uh, Will, what you said about how Stain, and both of you, Will and Ezra, him connecting himself to the weather is an extremely important um, part of this novel if you want to do an analysis of, of it and its characters. Um, and uh, Steinthor, one of my Icelandic colleagues, Jón Ingvi, um, he, he mentions that Steinthor, one thing that separates him from Salka in the way that he says, I am what I am, and he's actually being biblical in that sense, and I am the land and I'm the wind and all this, is he's extraordinarily arrogant. 
And you have a character like Sigurlina, who's lost in a dream world of religion. Arnaldo, who's lost in a dream world of, of political ideals, and also kind of a fantasy land of, of, of elf women and stuff like this. Then you have Steinthor, who's connected to the land. He's not, he's centered in the land. He's not in a dream world, but he's arrogant. And then you have Salka, who is, who is um, centered within the land, but not arrogant at all. And she's a caring individual. She takes milk to the villagers. She, um, she milks her own cow and takes the milk to the villagers. She, uh, I think Arnalder at one point, some people have said this in reviews that he, he says he would just let the poor die, whereas Sensalka just can't understand this at all. She takes care of people. So, but also Salka is described in these sort of very earthly terms. She, it says in, there's a very long, nice, really nice passage when toward the end of the book when Arnalder and Salka are walking and observing the birds on the seashore. And, and the birds become this weird sort of perfect communistic society. <laughs> Um, I can just read maybe just a little bit of this. It's on pages 549 to 550. Um, my pages might be a little bit different than yours because I'm working off an edit and not the actual book, but which I don't have actually. So, um, and uh, so there, it's a very beautiful passage, like the description of the, the night and the birds and everything. It says, the thousand winged turn let out its cold, sulky trills over the low Nesseri, communistic in its attitude towards stronger birds. That brings in the whole theme of the exploitation of the, that's very prominent in, in Sakharov. But um, it says, at a glance, the bird life as a whole seemed to be in wonderful harmony, in spite of various speculative ventures among certain of the birds and the capitalist blaze of color on the, on the sea and in the sky. Um, and then it goes on and it says, everything was so wonderfully communistic. Behind every little trifle was the hidden hand of the great universal Balshi. And so here you have more of this great humor creeping in here. But then it goes on and, and more, more descriptions of the birds and the eider ducks and their oo and voila voila. And, and then it says about Salka toward the end of this, it says, in, the, in her strong primal facial features dwelt all the merits of the salinity that is and always will be in seawater as long as it breaks against the shore. In her eyes and mouth dwelt all the heathendom and all the unostentatiousness of a land that was origin, originally intended for spotted seals and the callous broad-winged gulls of the sea. Her laughter did not seek to fly away into unknown depths like music. But was found with her, but was fixed with her body, firmly fixed and unable to come loose, almost entirely inelastic, a purely fleshly movement, devoid of, devoid of refinement and inspiration. I think it's very interesting there that he says that she's she, all the unostentatiousness of a land that was originally intended for spotted seals, etc., because she's the opposite of Stainthor there. there. He's ostentation personified and she's not so that's a curious little yeah i think that the distinction between her being the salinity of the seawater i just love that phrase that was one that i had i had underlined but yeah. that's a, a beautiful and so consistent for a lot of what uh what makes laxness great i think is you know if you take it literally like she is is inextricable like the salinity of the seawater or you know, if you take the the earlier image that you that you mentioned in that quote, the the capitalist blaze of color on the sea. At first, that seems some like something that's maybe just pretty, you know. Um, but then, if you if you actually take Laxness at his word and and look at it you, and see, like, yeah, there probably are these bright red fishing trawlers that have been introduced, and in, you know these uh, these artificial colors that just weren't there a hundred years ago, right? So there actually is, you know, I, I, this is what I just keep coming back to, to laxness for is that everything is, is so precise, you know, and yeah. I think that probably yeah. as, a, as a translator uh, comes through as a, as a big burden. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
is that does salinity that is the seawater is that something that um is the word salinity embedded within the word seawater in Icelandic? Was that something that, or is it that near cousin? Uh, no, it's uh, so. Well, I don't. I don't think I have the Icelandic for this right here. So, but Celta, it's like uh, uh, this salinity of seawater, or in your eyes, or it, it's yeah. But it's a different word than than seawater. So, but it's interesting too that. She's tied with the salinity because there's a very moving scene in Sokka Valka beyond all the all the Bosch of Stainthor and all the strange dreaminess of Arnaldur and the tragedy of Sigurlina. It's she, it's a really sad story with Sig Sigurlina and her suit. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, at one point, Sokka just goes up a hill and cries. I mean, when... Uh, it's it's a very touching human portrayal, and, and Loxness is often noted for his very um, understanding um, portrayals of, especially of girls and women and things like this. So I thought it was just brilliant, and also the end the end scene uh, with Sokka, which uh, is what I mentioned to you. There was a kind of parallel with one of the old sagas, Gunnlaug Saga Warm Tongue. I don't know if I should talk about it in case people haven't read the book or not, but I could say like, uh, if you haven't read the book, uh, go get a glass of water <laughs> Come back in, in a second. Because, okay, at the very end of the book, Salka is described as sitting there poor and alone. It's very sad. And if you've read Gunnlaug's saga, Ormstunga, there's these two guys who, who basically have a, a kind of, battle of one-upmanship over a woman named Helga, Gunnlöger and Hrapp. And they both kill each other, or they die. I can't remember how they die, but they die. And in the end of the saga, Hrapp, Helga is left holding a cloak that Hrapp, that Gunnlöger gave her. And it's a very sad scene. And it's just like, you know, what's left of all this ostentatiousness of these two warrior guys? And here we have the same with Salka Valka, because in the end, she's sitting there poor and alone, holding a locket that Arnaldo gave her. And he's gone off to pursue his dreams in California, which is very funny. So, yeah. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the process of translation. Your, your translation has been praised for its quality. Um, certainly, uh, as compared to the 1936 version, which I, which I understand was actually translated from the Danish, right? It was yeah. for worse. So laxness, uh, uh, he uses difficult language in, in Icelandic. He uses neologisms. Um, how hard is it to translate it? And, and how do you succeed in, in capturing the spirit and the, the subtleties uh, of his writing? Laxness is notorious for being difficult, especially because of his, his inventiveness and his, his, his neologisms and things like this. And you actually have a kind of little book that has like, it's a glossary of all the words. That, that <laughs> so Icelanders have to use the glossary. And, yeah. and um, actually, just to give you an example, once I asked an Icelander, can you help me with this sentence? I'm having a really hard time figuring it out. And, he, he took the book and he sat and he read, he read it for, he looked at it for half an hour, sat there like this for half an hour. Then he gave me, handed me back the book and he said, must have taken him a couple of hours to write that sentence. He didn't tell me what it meant. <laughs> he just said that. So, and, and, and a, lot, a lot of like his book, Iceland's Bell was considered to be untranslatable for quite a while. And, and I happened to just stumble into like stupidly dive head first into doing it without knowing how the reputation that he had for being sort of untranslated. But I can give you one little example um, here. There's one, one of the, I, I'm often stopped in my tracks when I'm translating Loxness because he's able to do stuff with language that is just, it's stunning. Sometimes it's so musical that, that 
you just savor it. And sometimes it's just, just so appropriately weird or something like that. The, uh, I just write these things down usually or I laugh when I get to them. And there's one scene in which um, Salka hears a kind of sing-song noise. This is, and I think it's actually Sigurlina who is, who is uh, uh, grieving for her deceased boy. And uh, it's a, a bit ghostly. And, and strange, and it says that, this is on page 219 to 220, it says that um, Salka listened closer. She realized that it wasn't reading, but something more like singing, all, the, all at the same volume and with relatively little change in pitch, like the most piteous whining of wind blowing in through a half open door. It even crossed her mind that her brother might have been crying somewhere in eternity and in a new manner. The boy is described as wailing piteously before he dies. But what could this be? The girl could not turn a deaf ear to this sing song. It wouldn't stop. It was as if it were intertwined with the night. And that little sentence right there, the girl could not turn a deaf ear to this sing song is actually in Icelandic. It's very strange. It's like, it, it's telpuni vareki unt alau thesu soingli o hlios eiru, which literally means the girl was not permitted to lend this sing song o hlios eiru, which is one word meaning an unsound ear, <laughs> which so which which um, I I translated she could not turn a deaf a deaf ear unsound ear to this sing song. So um, I think in the older version, it's the little girl could not get the droning out of her ears, which is a little bit different than what Lakshma says, but but that, that one stopped me also. And I just, wow, that's very strange phrasing there and interesting and, and matches the uncanniness of the situation right there. So, yeah. But there's some that are it's so mu it's so musical, just uh, and I think the the Guardian newspaper in a review said is is prose. He he writes with the unearthly prose of a poet or something like that, and and you it's really something special when you can read it in the original. So I try I try to get a little bit <laughs> across. So sort of preserving alliteration or something like you know or, or rhyme if there's rhyme. So, but it, I would prefer, like, I, I spent eight years or nine years translating Iceland's Bell just because I was doing it as a hobby. And I would love to do that with all these other books too. And then read them out loud to, to, hear, to hear how the English sounds compared to the Icelandic. I think that would be paradise for a translator to be able to do that. So. Um, so, um, paradise for a translate, but you didn't, you didn't, uh, you did a great job and you didn't spend seven years doing it, right? That's, uh, Sorry. it's plow through. the, uh, I actually had that passage that you just read marked as, as emblematic of what I think it's really hard to pin down what it is that, that makes laxness him other than i guess just balance it seems like you you know there's there's this incredibly dark humor um that's also juxtaposed with a with an empathetic connection that verges on sentimentality and then there's also this just you know i i take laxness's just general project as being like first of all describing the the harsh reality of life rather than, which I, I think the story of independent people of Laxness's most commonly accepted masterpiece is that it was in some ways uh, a response to, to growth of the soil because growth of the soil was this idyllic uh, farm life and, and Laxness, even though he was a, a big fan of Newt Hampson, thought that it was, it didn't do justice to the harsh reality of just shoveling shit on a croft right mm -hmm. and, and getting through the day um and i think you know then the other tradition that comes through is of literature uh and just 
study being something that might possibly take you out. So you have this intellectual component that's that is meeting this harsh uh, reality physical component. And then you have this just general um, glimmer of hope that it kind of reminds me of that um, of that quote uh, from uh, from Kafka to his to his friend where is you know his executor is saying well you know Franz there's just no hope in your work and he says oh no no you're you're misreading me there's infinite hope just none for us right <laughs> and I, I see that same thing happening a lot with um, with Loxness that there's almost like you know when you're in the fishing village there is a tremendous amount of, of hope but it's over the horizon and yeah and uh, the balance yeah. is just to me it's it's hard to it's it's hard to find anything that really matches the the way that he combines these elements consistently through through all of his works. Um, that there, reminds me. That reminds me of the description of the boy, uh, Sigurlina's little boy, who's who who is suffering horribly with some sickness, and then he starts to get better, and uh, and then it says, then came the sun, casting its wonderful love beams on that face as on all others, and then he starts to improve a little bit and then it says and then it says after a few more days in the sun the poor little thing had begun to smile at his mother such is man yeah. it's almost like saying what a fool or something like that you know it's 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 such as man making that mistake of, because you know something as bad is going to ha happen and it, it's actually cuz in this book the sun represents something that's it even goes on to say, it says, in, in his eyes appeared a tiny gleam that witnessed to ecstatic joy at God's son, which has been so highly celebrated by poets the world over, as it is almost the only luxury that poor people obtain on reasonable terms, those rare times that it shines. So, you know, it's it's like this, <laughs> this, that sort of the hope of the sun is is something so elusive and and when it 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 cure it heals a little boy it's just like such is man yeah, yeah. It's, i mean you can also see the same thing in the two word pair that recurs throughout the novel of the salvation army right like the two uh, yeah. anathemas of of loxness at this well maybe not i don't you could probably both speak to this a lot more than i could but you know, he has this constant struggle with Christianity being um, at times in his life, he, you know, he wants to convert to Catholicism and, you know, banish Lutheranism. And, he, and at times it seems like he's very close to a Christian tradition. And then at, in this novel, he's the Christianity is generally a source of, of ridicule or satire. And you kind of have this juxtaposed with the militarism of the, you know, this, this, army right and everyone's referred to as a cadet in the lord or a sergeant in the lord and you know he's able to to just combine everything in this kenning this just two word pair of salvation army that just mocks the whole the whole thing but in this dark way that that seems to encapsulate so much yeah except that it's kind of nice that uh, later uh, on in the uh, end of the first part after the death of sigurlina that the priest comes in and he's asking Salka about Sigurlina's favorite hymns. And there's a, a respect shown by Salka toward her mother. So uh, even though she knew that, you know, that her motives might have been sort of not not up, up to snuff or something like that. So, yeah, uh, it's very, yeah. I, that's one thing about Loxness and also about Loxness is, is it's extremely difficult to like, I picked a few uh, passages out to talk about, but you could do that with like almost every other sentence. It's, and that's one thing that's just a joy about reading him or translating him, it just uh, how, he, how he sustains that, um, that play and that uh, those levels of, of symbolism and of irony and wit and, he, and uh, tragedy. And, I mean, and also Salka Valka itself, the, her story is, it's, it's a very, very, very difficult one because you have Stainthor who basically uh, 
who tries to rape her. And, uh, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of real, uh, harsh reality in there that uh, speaks to a lot of these days too with the Me Too movement and stuff like that. So it's it was ahead of its day, I think, in, in those terms. So. Uh, I just, uh, real, real quick, I wanted to ask you, you said that he tries to rape her, which I think is uh, something that, I, to me, it seems like it's maybe up for some kind of hmm. open interpretation that there's a giant lacuna in the text between the line. And I'm really curious about how you how you translated this and maybe what. Uh, so this is after Steintor breaks in and locks the door and he's with Saul Kavalka and she is unconscious. And the way that she's only 14 at that time. Yeah, yeah. Or, or younger even, right? Like or uh -huh. yeah. Um, or 14 and and uh, no, no, you're right. She's 11, 11. Yeah, yeah she's 11. She's, I think, 11. Yeah. And you translated it as such was Salka Valka's first personal experience of love, which is just so brutal in this in this context. And there's and then, you know, we're left with nothing. Just, uh, you know, like a full section break into part two after that. And the, the lacuna in the text is. Um, is incredible, right? To where that just resonates in your head. How, uh, can you talk about that, sp translating that specific line and that specific question maybe of, of what actually transpired with? Um, yeah, uh, I, I'll have to find that in the Icelandic. If, uh, let me see if I can find it really quickly. So, um, and it's interesting too, that the very the first book is called is called love and then the second book is called death and so it's sort of like the one leading to the other um let me just see if i can find this one. while you while you look for that there's also just another example of one of the dark so steinthor comes back to this little fishing village and after having raped or come close to raping salka valka when she was an 11 year old and he says and do you perhaps think that I had an easy conscience those years that I was abroad after the way I parted from you? Which is just yeah. like, you know, that so, so dark um, just response on, on his part. It's like, after the way I parted from you. Okay, I found the sentence. It says, Slick for thou in fish the personal arranged for some Salka Walker of the Austin. Yeah, I just very literally translate. <laughs> yeah, and um, um, but I, I know because later on in the book, um, they had they're having these gigantic arguments, Salka and Steinthor. And interestingly, Salka Salka keeps taking money off of Steinthor, which is it's really questionable their relationship. And actually, the village, um, one of the reviews I think in the Oxonian mentions how how the village collectively shames Saka Valka. And it is very interesting, the relationship between of the village to Saka Valka, the village collective voices of the community. And, but so Saka is, is being sent money by Steinthor. And you think, why doesn't she just refuse? So that's a good question. But um, later on, and Steinthor tells her, spoiler alert, everyone, he tells her, you passed out and I didn't do anything to you. So, um, and I think he's telling the truth there actually. So, but, uh, and you kind of breathe a sigh of relief because it's just, I mean, and he's like in bed with Sokka's mother and then he's trying to fondle Sokka at the same time. And it's just, it's horrible. I mean, and the first, and you're reading through Sokka and there's these strange characters like the priest and the, and the and the ph pharmacist and things and they're all a little so strange and weird and I was like reading what a weird book this is and then you have Stathor and and this rape of Sokka and and yeah it's one it's one of the things that sets this book apart from his other books too is just how, how it is and unexpectedly brutal and things like this so um, yeah but I, just to 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 reassure people, Stainthor does say that he didn't rape Salka, and I'm pretty sure that it didn't happen, so. 
Um, we have a number of questions from the audience uh, that I'd like to, to get to. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, pick the one that uh, was the question I was gonna ask. <laughs> um, is the novel still widely read in Iceland? Uh, what drew you to translate it? Oh, uh, yes. Along still... those lines, you know, the, when Laxis won the Nobel Prize in 1955, not everybody in Iceland was happy about it, right? Because he depicted Iceland so, so badly in, in some ways. And yeah. uh, so I am curious how people think of Laxness today. Um, he was, uh, he was during his time, he was very controversial for his uh, iconoclasm, like taking the old sagas and rewriting them with modern spelling and things like this and, and appropriating individuals for his characters in his books. Um, I think Bjarter and the family, uh, the farm, the summer houses, they, they didn't like him at all. And the government was trying to get him on tax evasion charges and things like that. And the United States, they thought he was a communist, so they didn't. <laughs> so he was, he had to put up a fight and he was constantly criticizing Icelandic society, like uh, um, stop, stop coughing up so much when you're at the theater and stuff like this. He would really stick it to the Icelanders. So he was a kind of kind of a controversial character. But now he's sort of, you know, Nobel Prize. He's he's Iceland's Nobel laureate and deservedly so. And um and every most everyone I know has copies of these books on their bookshelves and they um read him constantly and he's taught in schools and and during his lifetime, uh, some of his books, his, it, it was discouraged reading Loxness or banned his books in schools because of his spelling. Was, his spelling was so strange that they didn't want children to learn the spelling. Okay. So, so, yeah, but now he's, he's, you know, ubiquitous. And it's curious to me to read, say, uh, the New Yorker interview that says the rediscovery of Loxness, because for me, he's just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I don't see how he sort of dropped out over in the West. So rediscovery is very interesting, actually. So, yeah. So how did you come to translate soccer? Was it because Jill assigned it to you or? Um, Jill actually asks me, um, what do you want to do next? And which I think is really nice. And I had- Jill's the publisher of our had, company, Jill Schoolman. Pardon? I was just telling people who Jill is. Yeah, the editor at the Archipelago, and and she, um, I I had actually started Salka like uh, sometime around the time I was translating Iceland's Bell, and I still have a few of those old files, and it's pretty funny to read actually, because <laughs> um, I, I knew so little Icelandic, and and uh, I think I just wanted to finish what I had started, so so we did the Great Weaver from Kashmir because that was his earliest. A major novel had been unavailable to anyone. Then Gepla, because that needed a retranslation, definitely. And then Salka also, because there's in the earlier Lion's tra Lion translation, uh, there's a lot left out, like most of the poetry and things like this. And almost all of the most difficult passages are out of there. And also, it's like out been out of print for ages. So. And you read online, like, uh, where can I find Salka Valka? And so it was time. It was really time for Salka Valka to come along. And uh, it's it also because it was one of the few that I could do. I mean, there's like uh, some of the other ones that Vintage has put out. They don't need retranslation right now. So Salka did. And there's not much left of his of his novels. So, yeah. With this, uh, another question. Uh, how do you feel about the Vintage translations? Um, well, one of them is mine, so that's okay. I spell, so um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I read those too. So I read Independent People while I was um, helping out uh, during the lambing, doing the lambing on a farm in Iceland. So I was waiting up in the night to go check on the sheep and reading, reading Independent People while I was doing that. So that was quite appropriate. And um, yeah, the, and so uh, it's wonderful. Magnus Magnus and all the work that he did on those books is just great. So, 
And uh, yeah, maybe someday, uh, and Independent People, of course, is considered one of the finest translations of any uh, writer, basically, especially of Loxness. It's considered the best. And yeah. I don't disagree with that. Um, but I would like to actually try some chapters of that sometime just to see how different the translation is from the original Icelandic, because I know that the translator of independent people took a lot of poetic liberty, so which made it beautiful in English. So, mm -hmm. And it's appropriate, too, because because Loxness is so beautiful. So. Uh, another question um, for all three of you. Is there a particular Loxness book that speaks to you? Uh, and why? What makes it stand out? Will, do you want to go for that one? Um, mine's <laughs> probably the the only person who really loves the Atom Station <laughs> that, I've, that I've met. Uh, it's one that's also kind of hard to get. Maybe, you know, maybe Phil translated at some point. But um, it's, uh, it is, I, I like it because of where we began the conversation. It's just wild. It reminds me a little bit of, um, of Bulgakov or um, or Wise Blood maybe um, or you know something like uh, Rivka Galchin or Heidi Julevitz's The Vanishers just something that's just by, you know jumps and has these uh, these really playful unexpected just leaps in the in the text and um, it it's strange it's uh, I think all of uh, I, I love Laxness for how he blends like dream, drama, and trauma, like these three words that are all near etymological mm -hmm. links all kind of combine, you know, and I think that the, the dream aspect is, uh, is, is really prevalent in, in Adam Station. That's a really good way of, uh, of sort of characterizing his writing, yeah. dream, drama, and trauma. Yeah. Ezra, do you have a favorite? Well, uh, I, you know, it's, it's it certainly would be between Soccer Valka and Independent People. Um, Independent People was my introduction to, to laxness, and uh, it was so gut wrenching. Uh, just, uh, uh, you know, a, a life changing novel. So, uh, and and it was. Uh, I was told to read it by one of our booksellers, uh, Amanda Bruns, who now is, a, is an editor at Publishers Weekly. Uh, and, um, Amanda was so right on. She said, you have to read this. And, and absolutely, I had to read it. But now Saul Kowalka is, uh, uh, I don't think, I didn't find it quite as, um, just because I, I, I'd already read several other Laxness books by then. Um, so, so I was used to the gut wrenching part of it, but uh, it is just such an intriguing book. So much to think about on so many levels, and uh, uh, just a, a true masterpiece, I think. And how about you, Phil? <laughs> um, I, I like. I think I like Salka the best uh, for a lot of things that I just mentioned, and and. Uh, there's just something I think it's the it's the masterpiece of all of Loxness's masterpieces. But I need to go and reread Adam Station again. And with <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I don't think that Adam Station. Uh, you know, even though it, I, I just think that I like it inordinately. But I do think that Salka, for me, World Light is maybe the one that's that I either World Light or Salka Valka is the one that the writing speaks to me maybe the most. Mm -hmm. in. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, it's crazy though, that this is, I mean, this is what I heard that initially drew me to this, that Salka Valka is the laxness novel, right? And it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's interesting that so far where we are in the whole history of, of laxness's literary reputation and, you know, abroad, it's, uh, this is really the first chance, it's going to be interesting to, to watch how the release of this book and when more people start reading it, how how that changes the conversation. I'm, I'm kind of excited to be a, a spectator for that. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. This is kind of a long one. Um, seems that laxness tends to use locations that aren't exact or specific. Uh, 
this can have a bit of uh, these Icelanders are similar to all other Icelanders type of feel. Knowing how influenced Haldor is by writers like Sinclair Lewis uh, and other American social realist writers, does it feel like his work is actually representative of Icelandic people of the time? Or is it more of a pastoral representation drawing in other cultures too? Oh, in my opinion, it's uh, very um, true to true to true to <laughs> a truthful representation of Icelandic people at the time. Yeah, yeah. The the I mean, also in Axla uh, in Sokovalka is a fic, is is fictitious. Um, it's set in the East Fjords, Southeast Fjords, but it's it's supposedly like in if you read in Icelandic, it's it's Iceland in a nutshell. Everyone, every uh, Iceland you ever have met in real life or back then in the historical real life is in that book. So, but actually, actually an Icelander told me, an Icelandic farmer once told me that that Iceland's bell encapsulates the spirit of the Icelandic people people better than any other of his books. So when an Icelander tells you that, then you know that what you're getting is real Iceland. You know, there's he, he really puts in nuts, bolts, and warts, and everything and all. So I yeah, I obviously can't speak to that to the question, but I can say that like the I've heard it said many times that laxness has changed the notion of what it means to be Icelandic that you know not only is he representative of what it's like to to be an Icelander but that his work has actually shifted the you know the consciousness of people in Iceland that it's uh, that it's generated in that sense which is a pretty wild you know claim um but it it's something that I I think the the pervasiveness of laxness probably does hint at that Yes, and, and being a Nobel laureate, it's it's fitting to Iceland with its grand tradition of literature. I mean, they really, they saved medieval Scandinavian literature for the rest of the world, the Icelanders with the sagas and king sagas and things like this. So they they needed laxness in the, the modern world. <clears throat> so, yeah. So this is a bit of a non sequitur. No, if I could just squeeze in one last uh, question. I I'm, I'm um, my wife and I are reading out loud uh, the uh, I remember you by here's a I'm going to butcher her name Sigur, Sig, Sigurdar's daughter. Um, you're translating a lot of uh, modern Icelandic mysteries. Uh, is that fun? <laughs> Do you have a good time doing that? Um, I yeah I haven't done that for quite a long time for yeah um, and. Yeah, I, I think I did four of her novels, and I'm doing actually one right now, not by her, but another writer. So, so it's just a very, it's a very different uh, style. And, um, I think all translation is fun. I think Loxness is, he stops me in my tracks much more than a lot of those other <laughs> books do. So, like, just because the language is so important to Loxness that he writes writes poetry on every page and that's not necessarily the the goal of those crime novels right it's, they have a different sort of uh, 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 end end goal so yeah. well poetry on every page there's your pitch for Sal Cavalca. it really is beautiful it's uh it's a lot of fun to read as grim as it can be um I have confirmed you can read it on the beach so it could be your summer beach read uh, <laughs> Um, Will, Ezra, Phil, thank you all so much for doing this with us. It was a fantastic conversation. Uh, Phil, thank you for bringing this book into English for American audiences. Um, those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of Selka Valka from Community Bookstore, Third Place Books, Brookline Booksmith, or your local independent bookstore. And we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again for joining in and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Ezra. Thanks. Noah. Thank you. Bye.